<laughs> Hello, everybody. We're just going to give it a minute here for everyone to, to join today. All right, it's about one o'clock. Thank you everyone for joining the Colorado HOA Information and Resource Center's September HOA Forum. Today's HOA Forum is entitled Attorney Perspectives, Board Member Rights and Responsibilities in Colorado. My name is uh, Nick Altman. I'm the HOA Information Officer. And joining me today is Amanda Lopez, Program Assistant for the HOA Center. Hi, Amanda. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. We also have David Donnelly, Manager of the Education, <laughs> Communication, and Policy Team with, with uh, Division of Real Estate. Hey, David. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, I'm excited to announce we have some very special guests with us here today. But before I introduce them, uh, Amanda is going to explain what the HOA Center does and does not do. Amanda? Perfect. Thank you so much. Let me move some things over. Okay. So what the HOA Information and Research Center, Resource Center does. So we provide information to homeowners regarding basic rights and responsibilities under Kiowa, which is also known as the Colorado Common Interest Ownership Act, we gather, analyze, and report information through complaints and HOA registrations. We create resource materials. We provide education and forums, such as this one today. Uh, we, we have a website with information for the public. We register HOAs that are pursuant to it. 38-33.3-401, and we provide annual reports to the legislators. What our H what the HOA office does not do, it is not a regulatory program. We do not mediate or arbitrate. We cannot provide legal advice. We do not act as an advocate. And the HOA office cannot assess fines or penalties. And last, the HOA office does not enforce an HOA's, fa uh, HOA's failure to register. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. Uh, with that, I'm gonna pass it over to David uh, Donnelly for a quick announcement on House Bill 23-1105. Absolutely. Thank you, Nick. Um, and Nick, maybe while I'm chatting here, um, uh, if you could double check the broadcasting to YouTube um, uh, for us real quick. Uh, I'm not sure if that's going through, but uh, um, but uh, uh, so I'll, I'll leave that with you. But I, I, I just wanted to take a quick minute and chat with everyone about House Bill 231105. Um, uh, many of you, I'm sure, have been following this bill for some time uh, since it got passed by the legislature and signed into law by the governor. Um, and I have some wonderful uh, up new, uh, uh, updates for everyone that's here today, which is that the full set of appointments have now been uh, received by the Division of Real Estate, which is wonderful news, and um, they are in the midst now of scheduling a, a, our very first meeting. I don't have a date for you yet. However, I uh, would encourage everyone to visit our website, what, what we would refer to as our engagement tool, um, at which you can find at www.engagedora.org. And then you can click on the homeowners, or excuse me, the HOA Homeowners Rights Task Force and find out all about those appointees, as well as the schedule for our upcoming meetings. So with that, uh, again, that's great big news. We're very excited about that and looking forward to continuing to receive a lot of uh, input from all of you and, uh, and looking forward to seeing you at some of our upcoming meetings there. So with that, I'll pass it back to you, Nick. Thank you. All right, thanks, David. Thanks for the reminder about the, the YouTube. <clears throat> and uh, if there are any audio issues, let me know. 
But uh, just a quick disclaimer here, the uh, information provided during this presentation is for educational purposes only and is not meant to provide, nor should it be construed as legal advice. And just a couple more housekeeping items. For today's presentation, you'll be able to submit questions in the Q&A feature on the bottom of your screen. We have several panelists here who will monitor the questions and try to answer to the best of their ability. If your question goes unanswered, uh, feel free to email Dora underscore D-R-E underscore H-O-A inquiries at state.co.us after the presentation. And I'll uh, include a, a slide at the end uh, with that email address. Um, so the HOA Center solicited questions in advance of today's forum. And I wanted to thank everybody who did submit a question. We had some terrific questions and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can toward the end. And as a reminder, this presentation will be recorded and uploaded to the Division of Real Estate's YouTube channel. A link to our channel is included on the bottom of this slide. So as many of you know, the HOA Center exists to assist the public in understanding their rights and responsibilities under Kiowa. Because we serve the public, we do hear from multiple stakeholders in the HOA industry, including homeowners, community managers, attorneys, realtors, and board members. And real quick, I'm just gonna see if I can put a poll up here to see who is joining us today. You should see a poll on your screen and uh, if you can let us know who you're joining as, uh, joining us as, we would appreciate it. So it looks like we got a little bit of uh, a, a couple homeowners, uh, majority board members, some community managers, and um, that's great. Thank you very much for answering that. All right, and <clears throat> types of inquiries we receive here at the HOA Center range from how to properly conduct a meeting, issues surrounding regular and special assessments, insurance requirements, covenant enforcement, and maintenance obligations, to name a few. While we can't provide legal advice here, our aim is to set consumers in the right direction by providing them with useful and informative resources related to their inquiries. So with that being said, Colorado has many great law firms that represent both the association and the homeowner with various types of disputes. While the HOA Center does not endorse any one particular party, such as a homeowner or an association, we firmly believe it's in the best interest of the public to understand all sides of the issue, whether that issue involves a broken water pipe, outdated documents, board meetings, or simply how to foster a stronger sense of community. All right, and without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce today's guest speakers, Tim Muller and David Graff. Tim Muller has practiced community association law since 1999. Tim supports associations in nearly all facets of governance and, enfor and enforcement, including creating and amending governing documents, preparing opinions concerning the many different matters facing associations, and drafting and reviewing contracts. Tim attends many association meetings and has council boards through difficult and sometimes contentious member and board meetings. Tim's provided continuing legal, uh, legal education to attorneys on the topic of condominium and homeowners associations. Tim has been accredited by the Community Association Institute to provide ongoing education to managers. Uh, Tim has published articles in both the local and national publications for CAI and has served on several committees for the Community Association Institute, including the Colorado Legislative Action Committee. Tim is a frequent educational speaker for the Rocky Mountain chapter of CAI. Hello, Tim. We're glad to have you with us today. Thanks, Nick. I'm glad to be here. And David Graff has practiced community association law exclusively since 2001. <clears throat> He is one of the most sought after community association industry trainers and speakers in the United States. David's a national faculty member of CAI's professional management development program. And for the last 18 years has traveled throughout the US to facilitate multi-day corporate trainings for professional community managers. 
In 2015, he was named CAI's National Educator of the Year. David's been admitted to the College of Community Association Lawyers, CCAL or the college. Of the thousands of lawyers practicing community association law throughout the US, fewer than 200 have been admitted to the college. In 2018 and 2020, David was elected by his CCAL peers to the college's board of governors and is the current president of the college. David is a stroke survivor. In 2013, he suffered a stroke after tearing his vertebral artery in a freak accident. David has always been an outdoor enthusiast and endurance athlete. After relearning to walk, dress, and feed himself, he commuted to work and to client meetings on a folding bicycle until he was able to drive again, nearly a year after his stroke. David speaks on mental toughness during long-term rehabilitation, living with chronic pain and human resilience. David's also a life and mindset coach who works with professionals learning to live their best life. He's a certified professional coach and holds the Energy Leadership Index Master Practitioner designation. Hello, David. <clears throat> hey, Nick. Thanks very much. Of course. Really so uh, our guest speakers today will give a short presentation on their law firm and who they represent, as well as a brief overview of the HOA industry and board member rights and responsibilities under Kiowa. After, the HOA Center will pose questions submitted by you, the public, to the panel related to Colorado board member rights, and Tim and David will follow up, uh, follow those up with their own expertise and knowledge of Colorado HOA law. We're very excited to have Moeller Graf here today, and with that, I'll pass the baton over to David Graf. Awesome. Thank you, Nick, Amanda, and David. Really appreciate the opportunity. And we really appreciate what you do for uh, the community association world. And we're going to breeze through some of these slides uh, because the questions that the public submitted to Dora were really, really good. And they've been incorporated into the slide deck at the end. And so we're going to try to expedite some of the historical stuff that we would otherwise talk about so that we can try to answer these questions because they cover a tremendous amount of ground and I thought were really insightful questions. So we we think that's the way that we can add some of the most value. Uh, and for people who are attending, those will be on the slides as we get there. So thank you. Tim, did you want to say anything or you want to just start? No, in? I just, you know, Nick said to, you know, say something about our firm. I, you know, as part of our, one of our slides here, one of our disclosures is that we, we represent the community associations. That's all we do. Our firm doesn't represent any individuals, any management companies, any banks, any anything other than common interest communities in Colorado. That's all we do. And so uh, that's what we specialize in. And, and so a lot of this is from that perspective, uh, having between Dave and I attended hundreds and hundreds of uh, member meetings, board meetings and things like that. And so over the many years that we've both been doing this, uh, this is kind of, uh, we're going to share with you some of our perspectives on, on those meetings and on, you know, what boards can do, should do, things like that. So um, having said that, David, anything else? No, it's, this slide is hanging out there for a long time. I think Nick's trying to tell us something, which is Dora does not endorse this information. We are, we are the ones who are presenting this. This is their forum, but they don't take responsibility. Educational use only can't give legal advice. We can't form an attorney-client relationship with questions or answers that we provide. So please, please use it with the spirit within which it's intended to be provided, which is helpful, generally advisory, um, but don't run out and do something based on what we said, because a lot of times there are more facts than, than might be apparent immediately. And as Tim said, we do represent communities. We want people to understand that because that shapes our perspective. Um, and, you know, that's what we want. So historical perspective, community associations are not new, right? There's an argument or a running debate. I don't know how vigorous the debate is, but whether it goes back to ancient Roman times or to the 12th century in Germany, where they, they've established historically that people would construct a building and then have co-ownership of the separate floors. Um, as that developed, in France, they first codified the idea of condominium or multiple ownership in property. Nick, do you mind uh, advancing the slide? Yep. Thanks, David. Uh, allow ownership of the separate floors. So that's relatively recent. 
Um, and then in 1964, I think the next slide says, there was the um, 61 is where condominium insurance or mortgage insurance for condominiums was made available, which really changed the way real estate was sold and used. Because historically, people purchased real estate, which was dirt. And the dirt was the most important thing. And whether there was a house on it or not a house or a farm or whatever was sometimes secondary to the importance of owning the dirt. And a condominium, relatively recent invention, is where there's a real estate interest that's, that's not directly tied to owning dirt. It's, it's directly tied to owning an airspace, which is defined in the association's governing documents. And what it allows people to do is to go up with ownership interests instead of spreading out and taking up all of the land, we can have vertical ownership interests. And what that does, in my opinion, it allows more people to own real estate, to build equity and, to, and to, to live that dream should they choose to do that. But again, relatively recently uh, in the United States that condominiums were, were statutorily codified. And, and in Colorado, I believe it was in the mid 60s. I think we, we I think we represent the second oldest condo in Denver and it's in the mid 60s. So relatively recent in terms of different uses of how people purchase and use real estate. Nick? So just as a reminder, and I know people know this and I apologize for stating the obvious, but we get questions a lot. Well, you know, my HOA board is running over me or they're doing things that are wrong or, you know, why don't I have representation or, you know, this, this idea of what, where we fit into these associations. And there's a governmental parallel, right? The U.S. Constitution guarantees to people a Republican form of government, which is not a political party. It's just a, an idea, Nick, where the people hold the power, the people elect representatives, and the representatives govern according to laws and governing documents and what have you. And if you're interested, you can read about that in the Federalist Papers, number 38, about this concept of a Republican form of government. And to me, where the homeowners have the ultimate authority as to who's going to be elected to the board, what the governing documents are going to say, it seems like a very close parallel to me. And one of the things that I'm hearing is people saying, well, I can't get on the board. you know, And because I can't get on the board, it's not fair. In my experience, my experience in that is a little different, which is that people who can play with others and can subordinate their own personal desires to that of the greater good really have an easy time of getting elected to the board, not perhaps in every case, but in many cases, because it is a often quiet and tedious job done without a lot of recognition. So Nick, do you mind advancing the slide? So just remember, it, it is a represent, representative function that the owners vote to elect their leaders. And from where we sit, and we represent a lot of communities, we see these boards turning over regularly. Every year, there will be one or two or three different board members in many cases, not in every case, but the homeowners have the ability to change that leadership on an annual basis. Or if they have to, they can do it more immediately by petitioning for a special meeting. The roles of owners in communities generally, and it's going to depend on what the governing documents say, is to elect their representatives to lead, to amend the declaration, which is the most important governing document of an association that cannot be by statute amended by the board, the vote to terminate the community, which is very rare, obviously, or to do anything else that is reserved to the owners to vote upon in the governing documents. Nick? And David, I think it's a, you know, this is, for those who are new in community associations, that's sometimes kind of shocking at how few items members get to vote on. And they say, oh my gosh, I can't believe I didn't get to vote on the new, you know, uh, the new pool chairs or, or what have you. And, and so they, you know, they, they, I think they believe that there's more opportunity, but the, the reality is, um, as you can see, the, the members have just a, few things that they're able to to vote for. And the most important of those is, is who's going to represent them on the board. Right. Thank you. And the, so the board, once elected by the homeowners, um, would administer the corporation. And under Kiowa, the Colorado Common Interest Ownership Act and the Nonprofit Act and most governing documents, they have reasonably broad authority to decide, you know, what the pool chairs look like or what landscape contractor is going to be hired for the next season or what the triggering depth of snow removal is. And of course, that's subject to whatever powers are reserved to the owners. And it's important to remember that board members to date 
and there's kind of a growing quiet conversation about whether unpaid volunteers represents the future of, of board member service uh, because sometimes it is tough to get people to volunteer because it can take time and it's often not often but sometimes contentious but it's important to remember that usually the the people who are on the board usually own a unit within the community it's not not required by state statute but many bylaws would say that you have to be a member or an owner to be on the board although not all um, and ultimately we want to understand that we're all playing for the same team right it's usually protection of property values enforcement of reasonable minimum standards of of aesthetics um, and and letting to the extent we can letting people live their private lives and we'll talk about sometimes when that can't happen Nick uh, but that's the idea and then there's committees right there's committees of the board usually they're committees of the board sometimes there's a financially a financial oversight committee which I find to be very helpful and healthy for communities that have a significant budget sometimes there's a you know physical plant committee for a mid or high-rise condominium uh, sometimes there's a social committee to to bring people together with a sense of community and often there's an architecture review committee sometimes that's an independently elected board elected by the homeowners most of the time those people are appointed by the board and often they're advisory to the board um, but but in some cases they're not and the idea is that if they're advising the board at least the board members were elected by the homeowners and so they're responsive directly to the homeowners who elected them um, and I and I think that works really quite well and our goal would be if we could depending on the community and the responsibilities is to have healthy and vibrant uh, committees so that we can number one get the word out to more people and number two kind of have a pipeline for people moving on to the board so that they come onto the board and they have a little bit of institutional history from from their committee service so that the changes in board members that happen regularly or is not the changes are not so abrupt nick and david with the with the committees you a lot of you will see in your documents it might only have language about an architectural review or you know whatever other name they may call that uh committee but you can have other committees and and typically those like david said work at the request of the board and I guess kind of a pro tip from doing this for many years is that it, it's a good idea to, as you're creating those committees, to also create some documentation as to what those committees um, should do and can do and things like that. We've seen it sometimes where these committees kind of take on a life of their own. And next thing we know, they're entering into contracts on behalf of the association, that authority or things like that. And so it's 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 good to have something saying, hey, here's here's how this is kind of kind of work. Here's what we want you to report back to us with so that there's some, you know, some sort of guardrails on on what that committee does. Yeah. And then there's a management company, which is not required. You don't have to have a professional management company. Some communities are self-managed where they have a board that manages all of the things. Uh, but many of the larger communities, in fact, pretty much all of the larger communities are managed either by an employee or by a professional management company. There was a licensure regime that the folks at Dora can still remember faintly, uh, where management companies and managers were required to be licensed as a condition to receive compensation for management. That statute, I believe it took effect in 2017, it was sunsetted, meaning it was set to expire automatically by, by operation of law. The sunset extension, which would have continued the licensure regime, made it through the legislature and Governor Polis vetoed it. Uh, his, his argument for vetoing it was that it raised the cost to the consumer as a result of the licensure and it was a barrier to entry into the management world. You, you know, my own personal opinion is it had some good and it had some bad. Um, the good I thought was that there were people watching at Dora who was keeping up with their requirements. Uh, there was a renewed conversation about insurance continuing education for managers, which I think was helpful. The bad, I think, was that it somehow, in some cases, became kind of a, a vehicle where people who didn't maybe get their architectural approval granted by their client would turn in the management company, and then they would have to respond to the DORA complaints. And I applaud DORA for the way that they handled the manager licensing regime, because it was a 
very, very quick ramp up at the time for them to establish a new division and have regulatory oversight. It was, uh, I don't want to speak for them, but it was pretty hectic time in their office. And I thought that, you know, for all the, the complaints that people made on both sides without knowing what was going on behind the scenes, it was a very, very hard act uh, to handle. And they did. So the managers are no longer licensed by Colorado law. I've spoken with a few legislators who have told me that they intend to bring that back. Nothing happened in the 2023 legislative session, perhaps because Governor Polis is still the governor. He would presumably veto that again. But when we, when the HOA information office first took effect, and this is my interpretation of what happened, some of the complaints that were filed with the office showed that there was a, and this is not to condemn anyone, but there wasn't a clear understanding of of what the manager's role was. And because the management team was often the face of the association in between board meetings, they would turn in the manager for a violation for a decision that might've been made by the board. And so, you know, educating the public, which Dora has done very well subsequent to that, about the difference of being a decision maker and actually a, an agent of the decision maker has been super helpful. Nick? So the legal authority that we have usually for associations for what's called the Common Interest Community is Kiowa, the Colorado Common Interest Ownership Act. And it took effect on July 1 of 1992. And when it took effect, it was split sort of down the middle. And the reason it was split down the middle is because at the time, the legislature said for every community that's built or constructed, and in that words, it would be the recording date of the declaration. Every community that comes online after this date is subject to all of Kiowa. And every community that was already built at the time that Kiowa took effect is subject only to the provisions in Kiowa that Kiowa says are applicable. And generally that section is 117. And so there's, there's, a, there's still a little bit of a tension between what we call a pre-Kiowa community and a full Kiowa community. So just be aware that if you're a community that was created before July 1 of 1992, and you have a mandatory assessment obligation, some of Kiowa, much of Kiowa will still apply to you, but not all of it, Nick. <clears throat> and then you have the Colorado Revised Nonprofit Corporation Act, which is a, a body of corporate law that primarily has default rules on, on how the association's corporation runs in the absence of language in its bylaws. There are some associations, particularly on the Western Slope, that are not nonprofit corporations. I was telling managers in a room 10 years ago, you have to look at the Nonprofit Act, and the manager said, well, my, my association's a for-profit corporation, and sure as heck, we looked it up, and it was, and they, they sold hay. <laughs> they had a huge amount of acreage, and they sold enough hay that their accountant told them not to be a nonprofit corporation, and why I'm saying this is because there are some associations that are not nonprofits, and to the extent that it's not a nonprofit, then you would not use the Nonprofit Act. It's probably less than 1% in my experience, but just be aware that we don't want to be reading from the wrong sheet of music because sometimes the, what the Nonprofit Act says will override the governing documents of an association. Not very commonly, but they sometimes do. Nick? So one of the things that comes up a lot, and we go to a lot of meetings, I think I'm coming up on my 3000th association meeting, is this concept of fiduciary duty or what duty the board members owe to the corporation. And sometimes we hear people saying, well, you have a fiduciary duty to make sure that my sidewalk is shoveled before 6 a.m. when I leave for work. And we usually say, no, that's, that's not the way that fiduciary duty works. It does not dictate an outcome. What it does is it dictates an input, a, a duty of care and a duty of loyalty to the corporation. And it's a higher duty, the duty that board members owe to the corporation than the owners owe to the corporation. And sometimes this creates a tension where the board members need to raise the assessments, even though they don't wanna pay that increased assessment and they have to put their personal interests and their loyalties to themselves aside so that they can make a decision that, that works for the betterment of the community as a whole, Nick. And so the fiduciary duty is the duty of loyalty, which is just the duty to put the association's interests ahead of your own. Um, and that doesn't mean that if you had a company and you wanted to contract with the association, you couldn't do that. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, but it's permitted under Kiowa and the Nonprofit Act. Um, but, but the idea is that, you know, don't get on the board for a single issue that is personal only to you. It happens all the time. We don't prefer that. 
But the idea is that we have to be looking out for the interests of more than beyond just our own interests when we serve on the board. Nick? And then there's the duty of ordinary care. And sometimes we call it the duty of reasonable care or just the duty of care, which is to be reasonable, to make informed decisions. And if you can't make an informed decision, then you might need advice from someone who can help you make an informed decision. The law does not require perfection. In fact, the Nonprofit Act is, and Kiowa are quite forgiving to volunteers who serve on boards. And so, you know, a lot of times we have people come in they might be upset with the way a project went or a new landscaping company that, that is still learning the property and it's not going well. And we, we remind people, you know, this is not a sprint, it's a marathon. And the law does not require you to be perfect. And some people are going to complain once in a while. Some people are going to complain all of the time. And it's your job to steer your way through that and continue to show up and ask reasonable questions make decisions in good faith and, and do your best. But the law does not require perfection because if it did, we wouldn't probably have nearly as many volunteers as we have already. And so we're always, almost always looking for additional people. Nick? The, 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 on that slide, I said make informed decisions. And that, you know, part of that is you're, you're not experts on everything. And I think that, uh, you know, sometimes you feel probably as a board member, well, I have to be an expert on, you know, roofing and I have to be an expert on paving and I have to be an expert on the pool and the chemical, you know, and to make an informed decision, you can obviously look to experts, your accountant, your attorneys, your, uh, you know, your pool guy, whoever it is to, to kind of help you make those informed decisions. So it's important to know that you've got, you know, you've got help and, and uh, you can seek that out. So one of the questions that comes up for us a lot is, well, what should I expect when serving on a board? Um, now, if it was my board and I had some reasonable control over the, the lengths of service or the commitment for service that volunteers would agree to, it, I would say, first of all, it's an annual meeting of the owners, generally. There's always one. Sometimes there's a budget ratification meeting. We'll talk about that later. Then it's either monthly or quarterly or, or you know, at least one a year board meeting. And after that, it is reading your board packet, being prepared. If, it, if you have a management company that will provide you a board packet, is reading the board packet and being prepared to go to a meeting to make decisions in an open setting. If you're a self-managed community, it's going to be a little bit harder because you're going to have to do a lot of the legwork as well to be prepared to make decisions. But the idea is that we want to funnel everything that we can in terms of board decision making to an open meeting. And I'll explain a little bit more about why. Nick? And so we worry about the annual budget as boards. We worry about infrastructure. And there's a huge amount of variety in what infrastructure a community will be responsible for. In single family home communities, the association might be responsible for a park area or open space or green belts or a clubhouse and a pool. In a townhouse community, is that that's not a legal term, but often the association will be responsible for the roofs and siding of the of the homes, plus the grounds in any common area. And for a condominium, the association is typically responsible for much of the bricks and sticks that make up that condominium building or buildings, because most of those would be what they call common elements that were collectively owned by all of the owners in the condominium. There's some vendor oversight responsibilities in terms of snow removal or landscaping or painting, or just depending on what infrastructure has to be repaired and replaced. And then there's covenant compliance, right? Which is how do we get people following the same rules and being held to the same level of accountability as everybody else? And that's generally the goal of an association board. And, and I think sometimes it becomes more complicated because of human dynamics. And so for us, you know, the, the, the idea is to create an atmosphere where rational people serve. And I think we have to, A, retreat to formality and do things at open meetings to the extent that we can, and B, try to minimize the stuff that we might do in between meetings so that it doesn't become a 20 or 40 hour a month job. Because in some communities, especially those under stress, it's, it's a part-time job plus for some of the volunteers. And sometimes that's necessary, but it's not something that's sustainable over the long haul. Nick? So some of the challenges that we're seeing for those communities that we represent and hear about from others that are represented by other firms, insurance premiums have gone absolutely 
skyrocketing this year. And it's kind of a perfect storm, no pun intended, of hurricanes on the East Coast, mudslides and other land issues in California. We had the fires in Hawaii. We had the Marshall Fire in Colorado. We had forest fires. Um, we had a number of hailstorms this year. And the insurance professionals are saying to, to me privately that Colorado had been kind of buffered from some of those drastic premium increases that other states that had more direct and visible natural disasters had absorbed in the market years ago. This year was a huge change in insurance premiums. A number of carriers got out of the market. And from some of the quotes that our clients are giving to us, you can expect your insurance premiums to go up between 25 and 1200%, depending on the nature of your community and what you insure. And that, that was quite a surprise, I think, to many in the insurance world and certainly was to us. Another challenge, relatively minor challenge to the compared to the insurance premiums is covenant enforcement after 1137. For those of you who don't remember, in 2022, House Bill 1137 was passed. It took effect on August 10th of 2022. And what that did was regulate association foreclosures, uh, collections, and covenant enforcement cases. And the foreclosure regulation, I think, generally is not an issue. The collections was a was a heavy lift administratively behind the scenes to get the new policies and the letters updated. But the covenant enforcement language, I think, left open some questions on how associations are able to enforce violations that are not continuing for 30 days. And we'll talk a little bit. One of the questions in the end is, is about that. And we'll talk about that in greater detail. And of course, there's deferred maintenance and reserve funding based on the, the age of many Colorado communities. Many are getting to the point where they need significant infrastructure replacement, whether it's pipes or flat work or membrane roofs or what have you, elevators, and always the ability to fund for that eventual replacement of that item. And another challenge, not just unique to 2023, but certainly seem to be exacerbated during the pandemic and does not seem to show any signs of slowing down is the amount of conflict either among the board members themselves or between the board and the community. And I think in 2023, I don't keep records of this specifically, but I bet in 2023, I did more board interventions. And I use that word sarcastically, meaning talking to boards about how they can better communicate among themselves so that they can do a better job for their homeowners probably did more of that in this year so far than in the last 22 years of, of doing this as a community association lawyer. So that's, it's a little bit disheartening, but it's also an opportunity for us to work on how do we communicate as a board and how do we communicate with our homeowners so that we don't have to hopefully continue to bang our heads against the wall. Because again, we should be, I think, all playing for the same team. The problem I think is some of us view what the team is and, and how we keep score a little differently. Tim? Yeah, I, um, if you can go to the next slide, Nick. So the, the suggested goal, I think something that's really important is what it says here, creating an atmosphere for the reasonable people to serve. And by that, we mean, you know, we, we hear about people, you know, they say, oh, they, they, they have this neighbor that is awesome and they'd be a great board member because they have these skills. They, they've run businesses or what have you. And they talk to them and they say, I hear it's going to take 20 hours plus a week. And I hear that, you know, you guys are getting attacked constantly and threatened at lawsuits. And why in the world would I, would I do that? You're getting a hundred emails a you know, week on the, and so what we, you know, what we're saying in there is, gosh, let's create some sort of an atmosphere where, the, where those people would want to uh, serve their community and make it a better place. And we have some, you know, some uh, discussion about that here coming up, but uh, I think that that it's important to try to rein some of those uh, uh, those things that are causing people not to want to serve. We got to rein those in a little bit so we get those reasonable and good people uh, to serve. Agreed. And the the honor owners participation. We have a whole class on that separate from this, but board members do a lot of work in private. They stress about the budget. How are we going to pay for the insurance premium increases? They do this in anonymity because a lot of times people are happy to let the board do that type of work. And it's it's significant work and it's significant stress to, to produce a budget that, that people will approve of 
and be able to fund the initiatives of the association. And because of that, because board members do that work in private, usually, I don't mean in private, they do it in open meetings, but a lot of times, unless there's something contentious, few people show up and people come in, right? Many people, homeowners come into meetings because of something that's personal to them, right? Whether they got a letter or their neighbor's doing something wrong or, or many homeowners come in or introduced to board meetings because of something that's important to them alone. And that's okay. That's very understandable human behavior. And sometimes when people come in, especially if they get a letter from their, their association, I mean, it's just normal human response to be aggravated at the least when you get a letter from your HOA. I don't, I don't know a lot of normal people that would not be somewhat aggravated if they got the letter, even if they understand how it works. And my neighbor used to park a trailer in front of my house and I'd get letters for my neighbor's trailer and because uh, people don't ever park their car in the street in front of their own home. They always do it in front of the neighbor's house, right? And, and it's aggravating. And so the homeowner goes to the meeting and they might come in a little hot, right? They might've had to stew over this for two weeks since they got the letter and they show up and they may not be at their best. Right. And the, the, the wise board members are the ones who've been around the block and understand that some people are situationally difficult and some people are bullies. And there's a huge difference in terms of who these people are. But you don't know who they are until they prove that to you. And if we take the position that people come into these meetings as valued neighbors and we treat them as valued neighbors instead of trying to make us feel them feel our pain of all of the work that boards do behind the scenes the better chance we are to have a conversation that does not make them twist off or become an anti-HOA crusader. And in many cases, depending on how we handle them, they might even consider running for the board. But if they show up hot and we push back on them and say, who are you to say this and how dare you? It starts off on the wrong foot and very rarely is there a good opportunity to get back on the right foot. So that's what we mean by honor the owner's participation is Forget that you've never seen them before, perhaps. Thank them for taking the time out of their busy evening to come by and talk about whatever issue is personal to them and try to listen and figure out if there's a way that you could solve that problem for them. They might be extremely gracious after you give them that grace and that space to blow off a little steam that I think is pretty understandable. Nick? David, so the, the first bullet point here is what I was, well, all of them are what I was talking about, about getting reasonable per people to serve. But the first one minimizes the email voting. And there's, you know, there's a question, one of the many questions that we have here in the, uh, you know, that have been sent in um, since the webinar started. One of them is about working sessions and things like that. So the email voting, you know, it, it's really easy to do. Right. And it's we do all of our, you know, much of our work that we do as lawyers is on email, email on the phone. And it's so it's easy. We're all used to it in our workspace and, and you know, dealing with our general lives. We're on email all the time. And so it makes sense that we're going to do email voting. However, um, the reason we say minimize that is because part of um, part of what we were speaking about before of having, you know, honoring owners participation, they don't have the opportunity to participate if you're voting by email. And so if they, if they are not participating, then sometimes they think, oh my gosh, there's secret stuff going on. They're voting about all this stuff. All these things happened in between the last board meeting I attended and this board meeting. And, and how did that happen? And how come I didn't get to, to speak about it and things like that, that the law says that at, board meetings that members have to have a time that they can speak before a vote is taken. And you, we're, we're not allowing them to do that when we're doing email voting. So you can do email voting. It's not illegal. There's a specific way you do it and you give a time frame and things like that. But uh, Dave and I, you know, say it's probably best to uh, minimize that to the extent you can. Utilize it for the things that absolutely have to be voted on between meetings. If it doesn't have to be, Let's push it to the meeting so that the members can can hear the board uh, discuss it and make those make those choices. And the you know the question about the working sessions, uh, there's nothing in the body of law that in the statutes between the Colorado Common Interest Ownership Act and the Colorado Revised Nonprofit Corporations Act that 
that talks about working sessions. It was kind of a made up thing. And I think um, there's, as I said, there's a requirement that boards allow members to be at the board meeting and to, and to discuss things before they vote on. And a working session, the, one, the type of working sessions that we hear about the most are where the board is, is working on something that, and they don't invite anybody. The Colorado Common Interest Ownership Act calls that an executive session. When there's a closed door meeting, it's an executive session. And there's certain things listed under Section 308 of the Colorado Common Interest Ownership Act that says, here's those reasons that you can call a closed door session of the board. And work, you know, those things that you're probably discussing in your working session may not be on that list. <clears throat> because of that, there's nothing illegal about because the board say, oh, we're not making any decisions. So we'll let the we'll let the members speak before we actually make the decisions. I, I think that's fine, but minimize that as well to the extent you can. And I get it. I get that you need to spend, you know, hours going over a you know 30 page contract um, that you don't want to do um, at the board meeting. But I would say minimize that as well. David, do you agree? I do. Yeah, I think that the best practice from my perspective is if we're going to have a working session or a, a board session that where no decisions will be made, I would keep it public and allow people to participate. You may not, you don't have to take comment at a working session because no decisions being made. But I think it's important for people to be able to be there when the conversations about budgets and big contracts are had. Uh, within with certain exceptions, of course, and there's exceptions under the, the law. Um, but the more you can do in public, the less likely you are to create the secret meeting stigma that spawns conspiracy theorists, because the reality is it's tedious work and most people don't want to do it. But if they're denied the opportunity to participate, it becomes irresistible and it's unnecessary, uh, in my opinion. Serving leadership on the board is just the idea that everybody has an equal vote, and the goal is to get the best out of everybody to make the best decision. I don't usually use the term servant leadership for boards applicable to the homeowners because I don't want homeowners thinking, well, that means there are servants. Well, they're your neighbors and they're your elected representatives. And it's helpful for me to use the term steward leadership, which I made up. It may be out there. I don't know. As the idea that, that the board members are stewards of this corporation for the community at large. You're not servants to any individual with a, with a personal agenda, but you're stewards for the vast majority of the people who live in the community, and they're counting on you to make a good decision. Nick, how do you, how do you create this atmosphere? For us, it's pushing out information. You don't have to. Um, but if people know that the association is working on its behalf, they are less likely in most cases, to see something or hear something or read something on next door and latch on to that, because often that's not often, but in many cases, that's not the full story. So if you keep people informed and have good resources for keeping them informed, you can minimize the community grapevine to some extent. You can't eliminate it. And I don't recommend even trying to compete with next door because people spend lots of time on next door posting all kinds of things. And the reality is board members have a finite amount of time that they have to devote to running the business of an association, and rarely do they have time to do both. When I talk about giving owners necessary context, it's just a function of, of the reality that the board will have a lot more information than an owner will. And if an owner hears from their neighbor, for example, that there's an assessment increase, they might start to think the worst. And so if you're going to talk about, as an example, an uh, assessment increase to deal with the insurance premiums, you might take a few minutes at the beginning of that meeting to, to give some information, the historical treatment of the budget, why there's a budget variance, what, what steps the board took to shop different insurance carriers so that, so that we bring everybody up to this minimum baseline of understanding, because I don't think it's it, it may be fair to think that people should read this information before they come to the meeting, but it's just not the reality. And if it's not going to be the reality, take affirmative steps to bring them up to speed so that they can be informed and so they can ask better questions and they can leave saying, okay, well, I showed up really hot thinking there was going to be an unnecessary assessment increase. And now that I heard all of the things that the board was struggling with and all the steps that they went through to get a different carrier with a reasonable premium, I can live with that decision a lot better. And that's kind of a recognition that owners are busy. And yes, they're not on the board and they're not doing the work of the board, but it's it's just not, it's kind of a fantasy to think that 
that owners are going to show up prepared. To me, it's much more effective to be ready to prepare them for the information without any judgments so that they can feel like that, that their time was well spent in coming to the meeting. It's just, to me, it's just a much more professional showing. It's less contentious. Um, and it, and it sometimes encourages people to come back and to participate. Nick. So longer term planning, right? It's a challenging issue to get owners to, and sometimes boards to understand that they have to or should put money away for reserves. Doesn't necessarily mean you have to be 100% reserve funded, but owners will often say, well, I'd rather keep my money and invest it because if I give it to the association for reserves, they have to invest in very conservative investments and I can be less conservative in my financial portfolio. Those who are often the same people that when they get the special assessment don't have the money to write the check when it's necessary. And so it's always a balance of how much can the association raise assessments to catch up on, because many associations are behind in their reserve funding, how do they catch up on their reserve study progress? And Representative Tatone and a few others had floated a bill two years ago during the 2022 legislative session that mandated reserve funding. And it made it through the legislature, but was then vetoed by the governor. And while I think the veto by the governor was right because there was not an identifiable time frame for which associations could get up to adequate reserve funding, the concept was sound, which is how do we create additional guardrails for associations to start meeting their reserve funding requirements so that when these capital projects come due, we don't have to have significant special assessments because nobody wants big special assessments. Nick? So we want to have frequent reserve study updates if, if the association has significant infrastructure maintenance. And I think frequent uh, discussions among the homeowners, either at every annual meeting or every budget meeting or a financial advisory committee or a long-term planning committee to keep talking about what it is that we will need to have in the bank when these projects come due so that the possibility of a surprise special assessment can be minimized. They can't be eliminated. Uh, and many communities, most communities probably in Colorado, to my knowledge, are way behind in their reserve funding. Um, but a lot of these communities are getting to the point where, where the can cannot continue to be kicked down the road. Nick? How do you keep board members motivated to serve? Next slide, please. That's a tough one sometimes. Uh, for me, it's expectations set at meetings, right? And, and it's, it's all about trying to quantify the volunteer time that a rational person would be willing to give to serve on a board. Sometimes that involves the use of committees, and sometimes that involves protection from difficult owners. Some of the meetings we go to are positively ghastly in terms of human behavior. And, and over time, reasonable people do not, in my opinion, want to put up with that. Uh, and And Sometimes there's an angry or entitled consumerism that is levied against the board, you know, these attitudes of how about this? And, you know, good decision makers will sometimes say, I just don't need this conflict in my life. Okay, so Nick, please. Um, so that's something that we seem to be spending a bit more time on. Uh, and difficult meetings are sometimes the, the linchpin of, of the solution to allowing more reasonable people or, or keeping reasonable people on the board. And sometimes it's a reminder that, you know, every community goes through a pretty predictable life cycle from, from developer control to termination. And it's not linear. Sometimes the community will have a lot more chaos and conflict and projects. Sometimes it'll be quiet. And then it will be another hurry up and fix this problem. And then it will be quiet again. There's also a civility pledge that the College of Community Association lawyers published online. You can download it. And it talks about treating people in a civil manner at meetings. Sometimes if the meetings get really bad, you might adopt an etiquette policy for owners and for board members in some cases so that, so that there's just minimum levels of decorum. You know, Obviously, we want board members to be able to dissent and to argue their position because I think that's how good decisions are made. But when we get into name calling and threats and cyber stalking and all other types of behavior, it, it just becomes unworkable. Meeting martial arts is a class that we teach about dealing with, with difficult people at board meetings. Um, and it has nothing to do with martial arts, and it's actually the opposite of what the title implies, which is how do we treat people in a respectful and softer way without responding to attacks in kind? Nick? 
So rights and responsibilities, the Community Association Institute also has this as a published document. You can download it. I think it's two and a half pages. And board rights and responsibilities, to me, they have a right to fair treatment from owners. It doesn't mean they're going to get it. But I would stand firm on the fact that they have a right to enjoy, enjoy their private lives within the community. I don't think that's something that I would negotiate with, Nick. Responsibilities is to generally understand the governing authority. They won't remember every provision of their governing documents. They won't remember every new section of Kiowa, but to generally understand what's going on. To treat owners fairly and hold them to uniform standards, that doesn't mean treating everyone the same. What it means is treating similar circumstances in a similar manner. And, and with that, you have the freedom generally to recognize that, that the rules don't always apply to every situation. Sometimes the rules create an unreasonable hardship in a unique situation. And sometimes we have to make a, a risk-based decision as to whether we deviate from the, from the rules because it's the right thing to do. Nick? And we have a responsibility to allow owners to inspect records. Kiowa's 209.4 and 317 are quite detailed. Um, and to the extent that we would consider alternative dispute resolution processes, I think it's a great idea. Anytime you have two people in a dispute who are reasonable enough to, to seek mediation, I think uh, that's usually a good thing. And I think mediation is super helpful. And we settle a lot of cases in mediation because the parties start talking. And usually yeah, what we say. There's a lot of county courts uh, that require that anyway. So by the time you've you've both lawyered up and you have, you know, I think there's a lot of county courts to say, hey, I'm, before before you show up in front of me uh, as a judge, you need to go mediate this. And so they'll they'll make you take a run at it anyway. So, you know, maybe maybe save the expense and the litigation and try that first. Uh, and if it doesn't work, then obviously, you know, you you have to do what you have to do as both a homeowner or a uh, association, but you know, it's, it's, uh, something to think about. Yeah, I agree. Nick, sorry, I keep saying Nick. So we're now we're going to move on to the questions. Here we Again, go. Great questions. Really appreciate the owners or board members in the community taking the time to submit those. Do you want to advance the slide, Nick? I'll try to summarize the questions pretty quickly and we'll give our answers. Again, we can't give you specific legal advice. We can't create a relationship on this, but we'll try to give you an answer. Can, can I explain the process for vetoing a proposed budget? Um, and is there a certain number of members required to be in attendance to do so? So Kiowa's 303 subsection four is the budget ratification process. It took effect in, I believe in 92 when Kiowa came into being. And what it says is unless the declaration provides otherwise, the board adopts a proposed budget. It sends out a summary or a copy of that budget and schedules a meeting of the owners to consider the budget. And at that meeting, unless a majority of all votes in the association, not just those present, whether or not a quorum is present, a majority of all votes or any higher number that the declaration specifies vetoes the budget, the budget proposed by the board is adopted. And that's the budget ratification process. So quorum is irrelevant. It's an affirmative vote down of the budget. And if that affirmative vote uh, veto of the budget does not occur, it moves through. I like it because it gives people notice and a forum to discuss it. But when association documents say you need a majority, for example, vote of the owners to increase assessments, those associations have a difficult time getting that because of apathy. And, and usually that's a recipe for reserve funding nightmares um, and deferred maintenance until it reaches a critical mass. Um, and so that's that's the process, 3034 of Kiowa. It used to be only post-92 communities had to follow that or were or, or, or guided by it. In 2018, I believe, they made it applicable to pre-1992 communities in a slightly unique way. But that's where you look. And it's I think it, it seems to work quite well from our perspective. And Nick. a little a little tip on that when you're when you're at that budget ratification meeting is what we often call it for the this is for the boards um you might know before before it even starts you might know that the the number of people that are in attendance personally or by proxy do not equal a majority of the unit owners and so the the budget's already passed before the meeting starts uh and and so sometimes, you know, we go to these meetings and we say, hey, budget's already passed. Sorry, everybody. Thanks for coming. Well, the people that are there, a lot of them want to 
to talk about the budget and and they want to tell you how much they hate it or like it or whatever else and sometimes it's good just even though the budget has already passed and the meeting is basically over to to at least you know let them have some time to discuss it um and and let them you know tell you what they think of it and you know the, the it's already been done but uh, at least then they feel like they've been heard and they don't have to feel like they need to you know uh take further action after that yeah and sometimes i would vote it even if we knew the result of the vote so that people could understand because it's hard to explain why they don't have the ability to vote on it and, and saying well there's not enough people here to vote on it to make it worthwhile is is sometimes hollow to people who don't understand how the statute is written uh, and again, we want them to to speak about the budget. We want to hear their comments, and we want to make sure that they feel valued in the process. So, so I think that's sometimes an opportunity that is missed to 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 include them a little bit more thoroughly in that budget, even if the outcome is the same. Sometimes the way we handle it is a lot more effective that way. Next slide, please. This <laughs> one's this one's interesting because it's I, it happens. Um, you know, fairly frequently, believe it or not. I mean, boards are always changing, right? As we know, as as you as board members know, and um, sometimes uh, something gets an improvement, gets put in um, that either wasn't exactly what was approved or it's completely against the covenants or, or what have you. And one of the things that this, uh, this individual asked, they said, well, how did, how do they address similar improvements that the current that the current owners want to engage in since there is a precedent and so the question is well is is there a precedent is it a legal precedent if somebody uh puts in something that uh that they weren't supposed to and you know i think there most people think the answer is yes i don't know that it's that clear i don't think it is and i think that there's first of all there's a statute of limitations in section 123 of the colorado common interest ownership act one year from when you knew or should have known that the improvement was put in, uh, you have to take action. That doesn't action doesn't mean sending them a letter saying please remove it. Action means legal action, a, a lawsuit. And so there's that. And so if, if someone put in a shed and it says no sheds and it's been there for a year uh, under that statute, and you you a year from when you knew or should have known if the thing's right there, uh, then they get to keep it. Does that mean that now we just go okay? I guess every single person here can get a shed. I don't think that's the answer. I think that the, the covenants still stand. I don't believe that's a waiver and uh, of that covenant. And I still think you can restrict it. And there's been associations that we have taken over as legal counsel where they say, oh, you know, all these things were let go for the last, you know, umpteen years. And how do we turn the Titanic around so we can start, you know, start enforcing our covenants again? It's a slow, long process of, of lots of, aggressively pushing out notifications and communicating with people. Um, and yes, there's gonna be some things that are still in the community that weren't supposed to be in there in the first place. But uh, I still think that you can you can move forward in enforcing your governing documents and you do that in a, in a, uh, a fair manner, meaning that you're going to treat similar situations similarly uh, to avoid you know, selective enforcement. David? Yeah, I agree. I just, if there was a mistake made or something got by, it doesn't mean we have to live with it forever after. I think that would be essentially betraying the the covenants and, and the expectations of the owners who relied on those covenants. And so for me, it's how do we create a bright line of notice so that if people wanted to look at that and do the same thing, we would have a, a justifiable paper trail to say, well, we told you, you, you couldn't do it. Um, but I agree with you 100%. The covenants are supposed to live with the land, run with the land in perpetuity until they're amended or repealed. And there are going to be instances where things get by. And that's just the reality of it. We don't throw up our hands and say, oh, well, we just have to allow sheds or who knows what. We just have to work, you know, uh, intentionally to try to minimize the possibility of that being a problem going forward. Next slide, please. Okay, so this one. Uh, Short answer is there's a homeowner in our neighborhood who can't pay their assessments and we don't want to put a lien on their property. How do we gently you know, move this person towards getting rid of the delinquent balance? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. So the first thing to, to note is that we would look at our covenant or collections, excuse me, our collections policy to see what we do. Doesn't mean that you have to be more aggressive. I've never seen courts 
punish associations for being more lenient as long as it's done uniformly. And if you only have one person who's delinquent, then you don't have to worry so much about the precedent. If you have a recorded declaration, um, the person is going to have an automatic lien on their property under Section 316 of Kiowa. So you don't have to put a lien on their property necessarily. Sometimes those are missed during title company administration of, of closings. So sometimes in many cases, liens are recorded just so they don't get missed. But you should have an automatic statutory lien on the property. And then the question for us is a conversation with an owner to say, how do we get you back on track? Right. And if you're not worried about treating people differently because there are no are no other people in the same situation, you have a lot of latitude, I think, to try to shepherd this person back to a non-delinquent status with with courtesy notices or a polite conversation. And sometimes it may take a while and that's OK. So, I again, as long as you're not treating people differently, I think you, you pretty much have all types of different options to try to wait, negotiate, encourage uh, without without running too far afoul. Now, debt is only good to be collected six years after it became due. So if that was going to be a six-year time frame, which usually doesn't happen, um, but if after six years, the lien would fall off as a matter of law and the delinquent assessments would be time-barred under the statute of limitations, that's an outside boundary. But within that, if it's a small problem, you know, um, I think you, you, you have the latitude to be compassionate. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is an interesting one and, and a common one, which is when we have meetings by Zoom, if everyone gets to speak, you know, calculating up, you know, how many people could speak, that means our meetings go four hours. Well, Kaya was, what is it, 308? 308, yep. 308 says people, owners are entitled to speak before the board makes a decision and the board will allow a reasonable number of people to speak on each side of the issue. So you don't have to allow everyone to speak, but our goal would be to allow people to be heard because the person that's going to be cut off will feel that they had something super important to say, and maybe they did, and, and it seems unfair to them if they were cut off. But the real issue, I think, is, you know, I, and I'm not asking for the answer, but is this a theoretical issue or is it an actual issue? Because if we have owners asking four hours worth or two hours worth of questions at every board meeting, the question in my mind would be, how do we set this up so that we can better educate them in between meetings? And how do we be more responsive so that the number of questions that they have to ask at the board meeting are whittled down? It or may maybe, be, oh, go ahead. Yeah, perhaps those meetings are quarterly and maybe you need to make it monthly, you know, because right. there's so much stacked up business that's causing four hour uh, meeting. But yeah, that, that is concerning that you're having, you know, and again, it goes back to, we want reasonable people to serve having four hour board meetings uh, is going to be uh, a hurdle. Yeah. And you might have a lot going on in the neighborhood at the time, like a big restoration project or a pool renovation or who knows what. And then it might be just a realization that we have to spend more time right now to keep our homeowners informed because they have a right to know what's going on. And we want them to be informed owners. Uh, and just just commit to either more frequent meetings or longer meetings until you pass that hurdle. But if it's a longer term issue where there's that amount of questions, there has to be there. I promise you there's a, a, a logical solution to keep people informed and to try to minimize those questions. And it might be soliciting questions outside of a meeting, having a working session, prepare the answers and circulate that. I don't know, but it's indicated that there might be something more going on if we have continually very lengthy meetings. Nick? Uh, okay, so this question is, you know, we don't, we it's kind of a second home community. And what happens when people don't want to serve on the board? We have common areas to maintain. What happens? Well, you could have every one but one director resign or die in office or just leave the, the position. And you could still do business even though the remaining directors are not a quorum, but it's not really a great long-term solution, right? The long-term solution is to cultivate interest in people volunteering. And as we've said before, crucial to that exercise is creating that atmosphere where people are not signing on to a part-time job. Worst case scenario, and we've had this happen where all of the directors resign and no one's interested in serving on the board, Sometimes we have to apply to the court for a receivership, which is basically a court order appointing someone to take possession of the board 
and to run the corporation until the homeowners can get a board constituted and take it back to local control. And we don't threaten owners like, you know, we don't send out letters saying, hey, this, you know, we're going to do a receivership unless it's actually likely to happen. But if if the board is really concerned that when these board members, maybe they're all moving out or they're all going to resign, sending a letter to people saying, if when we resign, if there's no one there, that may be the only option. And it's not a good option. It's an expensive option that involves legal fees and a court appointed receiver who obviously is not likely to care as much about the community as, as the people who live there would. Uh, and very often, I met people at a meeting last night who said, yeah, we got on the board because they got a, we got a letter saying there was going to be a receiver appointed. So we volunteered. And they took back to control of the association and they avoided a number of costs. Um, and it sounds, from what I can tell, it sounds like it's working well. So that's something that you could do. Because when the corporation doesn't have leadership, it's hard to pay the insurance premiums. It's hard to co you know contract with vendors. It's hard to collect assessments to pay for those vendors. Uh, and somebody needs to be in the decision-making seat, even if it's one person. Nick? This one is, you know, you, when you read it the first time, I thought, oh, notice of meetings, that's e easy. Statutorily, it says, well, it's board meetings, the time frame for board meetings. Now, statutorily, there's there's uh, defaults for notice of member meetings, annual meetings, but for board meetings, there's not yet. I think someday there soon there probably will be, but uh, typically it's it's um, a situation where boards say we're going to meet on the third Thursday of every month at 7 p.m. in the clubhouse or what have you. And and as far as those are concerned, those regular meetings, they don't have to send out uh, notice to the members. So the second part of this question, should the agendas be mailed out in advance? Well, the agendas under 308 have to be made reasonably available to these individuals. Uh, the homeowners that want to go to the meetings and mailing them out would be great in advance. I think there's there's some expense involved with that. And so perhaps you want to say, hey, anybody who wants the agenda, give me your email address. And that might save the association some money. And it, that way, the people that are receiving it were the ones that wanted to receive it. Um, but, you know, is there is there a requirement? No, there's not a requirement that the agendas be mailed out in advance and reasonable notice for board meetings. Um, the board should all know who's going to be there, but as far as notice to the rest of the, of the association, there's no legal requirement. So I think it just has to be whatever is reasonable, whatever you think is reasonable to, that, to make, how, allow them to, to plan on it, especially if you're not holding it regularly, like third Thursday at 7 PM, uh, then you're going to want to give more notice if, if it's not a regularly scheduled meeting, David. Yeah, I mean, we want a protocol where owners can feel um, comfortable that they're going to know when there's a board meeting. Um, and and within the statute's ambiguous, and some courts have interpreted it this way and some have interpreted it that way. But the reality is, ultimately, we want people to know when the board meetings are going to be held because the right to participate and attend and speak doesn't mean a lot if, if it's a secret meeting. So for me, if it's the third Thursday at the clubhouse or you have that flex of that that rigidity possibility in your calendar, that's very easy. If it's going to be, well, we're going to call a meeting on the fly and here's how we're going to tell the homeowners, make sure that that protocol, I think, provides some, some time so that people can, can make plans and plan on attending. Because if it's always these last minute, oh, we're going to have an impromptu board meeting tomorrow night, it's going to start to, people are going to start to look like or think that, um, that the board is doing this intentionally to exclude them. And that's the last thing we want to, that's the last appearance that we want to create for our clients, right? It's just easier to handle. If there's a problem, call a meeting, give people plenty of notice, handle it. But if we do something else, it only gets worse. And usually, or in many cases, exponentially worse. Nick? So David, we've got 11 more questions to answer and we've got 15 minutes to answer them in. And we are the only thing standing between these fine people and an absolutely gorgeous Colorado day on a Friday. So we will try to race through these as fast as we can. We've also got 33, no less than 33, it looks like questions online since we've started and they are good questions, really great, thoughtful questions that I don't think we'll have time to get to. But, uh, you know, if Dora is willing at some, uh, some future stage to allow us back, we would be, uh, 
happy to come back and, and work on different topics and subjects to see if we could help. Uh, so let's let's move on to. Uh, I see. Nick, did, you have next a, picture. did you want to say something, Nick? No, David, uh, I just we really appreciate appreciate you being here and sharing your expertise with us. We're OK with uh, answering a couple more questions if you sure. guys are. Yeah, Absolutely. please do. Let's do the next one. We'll Thank try you. and rip okay. through here. Thank you very Good much. Enough. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so if the a homeowner gets a fence approved by the ARC and then they build a different fence, what recourse do you have to make them change it so that everyone doesn't get to build the same fence asserting selective enforcement? So under 1137, which was the bill from 2022, they changed the way associations enforce covenants and they divided all covenant violations into one of two camps. Those things that violate the public health and safety and those that don't. And I don't think this fence likely is a public safety issue. It could theoretically be in some weird circumstance. But in that event, it's a 30-day written notice sent out certified mail return receipt requested to the owner, giving them 30 days to cure. If they don't do anything within that 30 days and don't fix it, then you have seven days after the expiration of the 30 to inspect. And if they haven't co corrected it, then there's you can start fining them up to a maximum fine of $500 then there's an automatic 30 day, additional 30 day cure period. And after that, you could uh, file a lawsuit to ask the court to order them to remove it. So the short answer is 67 days of cure period, maximum $500 fine, possible lawsuit to force the removal of the fence after the 67 day window, assuming that you mailed out all the letters in compliance with the statute. Great question. And what we're asking for is a court order to say, I, the court, order you, the homeowner, to remove or modify the fence so that it is no longer a violation. Nick. All right, thanks. And uh, David, just for your information, we have 10 more slides. So okay. just for a heads up. I'm an optimist. Let's do it, man. <laughs> David's fast. Most owners are very courteous when they receive a notice of violation. Some threaten us with lawsuits or claim harassment or discrimination. What's the best way to respond with these threats? Well, the first thing might be, to look at the letter that's being sent out. And I think under 1137, the letters got a lot more aggressive right out of the gate because of the statutory requirements. Uh, and sometimes for me, the first letter is just, hey, you might not have noticed that this is something that we think is a problem. We would love to talk to you, right? So first is letter design so that it's more of a courtesy reminder and not a, a condemnation and a judgment that you are guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Not, not just design even, it's the policy. So the the... Like David said, the law requires a pretty aggressive letter to be sent before you can really go further. And I mean, it's it's aggressive. It says, That's here's all the bad things we can do to you. Um, so maybe if that's the first letter in your enforcement policy, maybe bump it so that you, you give that one really nice, hey, maybe you didn't know this about our community. That letter maybe goes first before the, the full on, you know, um, the full-on aggressive yeah. letter. Yeah, and the har harassment and discrimination are two radically different things. First of all, sending someone a letter is not harassment in and of itself. Now, if somebody was emailing you constantly, cyber stalking you, you know, telling you what a lousy person you are on social media repeatedly, that might be harassment. That's not usually what associations do because their processes are dictated by their policy. Now, discrimination is a little bit more delicate because that person might believe reasonably or not that they're the subject of unequal treatment uh, based on their status in a protected class. And so for us, we would look back at it and say, okay, well, we probably don't know any of the protected class status of this owner, race, gender, national origin, color, uh, religion, and so disability status, familial status. And if we don't know, and it's said you know, more than just you're discriminating against me, um, we would look into it. So if somebody says you're discriminating against me, they may not know that you sent out 42 other letters to people in the neighborhood saying, please don't keep your boat in the driveway. And sometimes we wouldn't give those letters out, but we might call the owner and say, you, you may not know this, but there's other, a number of other owners who got that same letter. And if if there's a, a boat that is that you see that you feel is not being handled the same way yours is, please send me the address so that we can make sure that we're enforcing the covenants uniformly. But discrimination is, it's said very casually. Often it is not the case, but I think we always want to be careful that there's a possibility that this could result in discriminatory, discriminatory treatment based on someone's membership in a protected class. 
because when when that is the possibility, then we have additional duties and liabilities to worry about. Nick. Okay, campers. This is eleven thirty seven, the cure period. So if somebody puts their camper in their driveway for thirty days or twenty nine days and they move it, is the violation cured? Possibly. Um, that's that's the language of the statute. And I think you could write your covenant enforcement policy to say that if we have episodic or repeated violations of this covenant, you know, X number of them in a certain time frame, we're going to declare by policy that it's not cured. I think the stakeholders, and I don't want to speak for them, um, but they're aware of the issue, the 1137 stakeholders, the people who wrote the bill, they're aware of some of the uh, challenges in enforcing this when it is not a consistent or persistent 30 day plus violation that does not come and go like noise and smoke and campers. So I think you could do it. You could write the policy in a way that you could deal with that 29 day camper thing. Um, but you don't want to be the test case, right? We don't want to take our clients and make them be the ones that test the statute. And so we're hoping to work with the 1137 stakeholders, and I don't mean me and Tim, but the association world, to work with these people um, who listen uh, and I think have the best interests of communities at heart to make the statute uh, a little bit more responsive in some of these nuances that may may not be handled perfectly with the current bill language. Nick? Okay, board's fiduciary duty. Um, a realtor knocked on the board president's door, asked him if there were any special assessments. And the president says, yes, we have a special assessment. And the question is, wouldn't that discourage people from buying? <laughs> it probably would. <laughs> um, if I was buying a house and I found out that there was a special assessment, it would definitely uh, be something that I would weigh in terms of the economics of the deal. We've had this issue before about looking up the duty to disclose special assessments, and I think the law is all over the place on this. Um, and so for me, you know, what we want to do is for we want to create minutes and documentation and paper trail if we can that's that has the information that we have going through the board available for people to review. I mean, ultimately, in a perfect world, we wouldn't have people buying in, being surprised by special assessments. I don't think that anyone would appreciate that. It's just that very often the conversations that start about a special assessment may not result in a special assessment for months or years later. And that's where the, the duty to um, disclose becomes a lot more ambiguous. But the thing about it, if it's a self managed community, and there is no management company, then I understand the board president answering the door. But the reality is, once the board president is out of the meeting room, they don't really have specific authority to speak on behalf of the group. And for, for those communities that have a management team, I would defer it to them so that the information can go to every one of the directors and that management team can keep a record of the conversation so that the board president, you know, if the homeowner if the board president said, yeah, there's a special assessment and the realtor told the client, no, there is no special assessment. Now we have an argument about what the board member said on his doorstep that we can avoid. Nick? <laughs> what should one board member do when the majority of the board refuses to follow the governing association bylaws? The first thing I would do is find out if that conclusion is true, right? And this is kind of the age old question. Am I the only one who knows what's going on as, and is the entire world crazy? Most of the time that question is answered in the negative. So the first thing to do is if you're the only one, is there a reason that you're the only one? And if you're not the only one and it's truly the, a conclusion, an accurate conclusion that they're not following the governing documents, there, usually there'd be a polite conversation about how we follow the governing documents. Sometimes we might point them to Dora videos or or get some of the educational resources from Dora to them so that they can understand that the duty to follow the governing documents exists, even though there might be nuances on whether it's a violation or how you follow them. And if that's not the case, sometimes you can invite a law firm in to give education to the board and scare people, not unreasonably scare people, but just say there are consequences for not following your governing documents, certainly intentionally. And after that, if it's still a problem and I can't give the individual legal advice, 
they may have to decide whether they want to get off the board and pursue their own rights, depending on how egregious it is, or they might want to, at a public meeting, and I'm not saying to do this without a lot of consideration, exp you know, have this agenda item to talk about how we follow the governing documents in a more accurate manner. Can bring on liability to the association when that dirty laundry is publicly aired, but at the end of the day, we're all stewards for the corporation to represent the inter interests of the owners and you know, deliberately ignoring the governing document requirements is not a way to, to represent the owners in a long-term successful way. Nick? We got uh, <clears throat> six more questions, David. Don't feel rushed at all. They are some good questions coming up. <laughs> oh yeah, these are fantastic questions. I'm so appreciative. I'm trying to answer some of them here on online as well, David, while you're Oh, and thanks. Others. So, so any tips on how ballots should be structured or created so to so as to ensure maximum transparency and voter confidence? So the first thing to understand is that there's two ways to vote at the owner level. One is in a meeting, whether a video meeting, telephonic meeting, or in-person meeting, in person or by proxy, option one, or taking action outside of a meeting under the nonprofit acts action right written action by written ballot section. And that section has specific magic words that need to be contained in the ballot and the, in the solicitation for ballot that you need to follow. And one of those requirements is a reasonable explanation of what the issue is to be voted on. So sometimes, you know, we follow the language in the Nonprofit Act, which essentially outlines all of the necessary information that has to be in that solicitation. And sometimes it's a, if it's a complicated issue, we would schedule a town hall meeting in the voting window and tell that to the owners so that they could ask questions and make a more informed decision on the issue in front of them. Nick? Uh, master insurance policies doubling or tripling. Um, what do you have, what advice do you have for HOAs and boards that cannot find insurance coverage or have the money to pay the premiums? That's a complicated answer. Now, Kiowa's 313, which applies to post 92 communities, says in terms of the providing of insurance at the association level to the extent reasonably available. In some cases, it's not reasonably available. And, and that's, that's kind of an hour long conversation, but it involves bringing the owners into the loop and telling them, listen, we can't find insurance and we don't have the money to buy the insurance and here's what we're planning on doing. And we'd ask you to go out and see your insurance agents immediately to see what you could purchase for supplemental coverage it might require you amending your governing documents to change the insurance responsibilities contained within it, depending on what type of community you are, whether a single family home or a townhouse or a condo, and when you were created. If you're a condo, post 92, under Kiowa, you can, you can only give up the insurance from a property perspective, and that's the issue. It's not, not the liability or DNO policies, it's the property policies. You can only give up that obligation because it's imposed by state law if it's reasonably unattainable. And, I, and to me, that, that's a pretty high burden. So talk to an insurance agent, talk to your lawyer, but it's happening. And we do have associations and we hear of associations around the metro area, particularly, who can't afford insurance right now. Nick? Can we amend, amend our bylaws to have no smoking in common areas as well as individual units? So common areas, the board, unless the governing documents say you can't, you can adopt rules to govern the common areas. So I think you could have a non-smoking policy for the common areas by rule. If you're going to say that owners can't smoke in their, in their units, and, and there's two ways to do this. One is you can't smoke in your unit if a neighbor smells it and it bothers them. You might be able to do that by rule. But if you're saying you can't smoke in your unit no matter what, that's going to be a declaration amendment. That's going to be probably at least two thirds of the owners to agree to a declaration amendment to make a smoke-free building. I'm only aware of one case in Colorado where that happened. It went to a lawsuit. It was a four unit townhouse in Jefferson County and it was upheld. Uh, but as I recall, they did amend the declaration because that's adopting a use restriction. It's not saying you can't smoke if it's bothersome. It's saying you can't smoke almost universally going to be a deck amendment. Nick? And oh, by the way, that when he says it was upheld, it did not, it's not a precedential setting case in Colorado. It was just district court case. So there's no precedential setting case in Colorado about a smoking prohibition. Uh, it's gonna obviously be a lot easier in a four unit condo than it is uh, in a 287 unit building. Yeah. yeah, totally. Thank you. Can we update our bylaws to forbid the purchase of an investment property and require all owners 
require all owners to occupy their units full time. Yeah, you could amend your declaration. You wouldn't be a bylaw amendment. Uh, you could amend your governing documents, which would probably be two thirds or higher owner vote to require certain conditions on leasing or even a lease restriction or lease prohibition. I don't know about requiring them to live in the unit full time because we have a lot of communities where owners have multiple homes and they don't rent them out. And if they're vacant, we don't care if they live there or not. I think that's their right. Um, so I would, I would create a distinction between that. Uh, uh, lease restrictions and living there. And it's, the proposal is we're going to have a lottery. Every odd year, certain, certain units get to lease and every even year, the other units get to lease. It's a little chaotic, I think, to administer um, because now you're talking about having you know, leases that might be shorter than a year so that you have a little bit of a buffer window and then the other people can market their unit for a year and I don't, I haven't really thought it through as, a, as a, to how it would work, but it sounds a little chaotic. And when we have chaos, um, often we find that we're not serving the owners as well as we could. It might be a longer term rotation of that, um, but a year to me seems reasonably close uh, as, a, as a short term window to regulate leasing. Nick? Is it proper to combine a special assessment charge with their regularly scheduled periodic assessments on their statements? Yeah, I think so. There's nothing in the statute that says that you can't. Uh, and if they're delinquent, you would include everything that the owner owes under the itemized list section of 1137. So I don't see a problem with that. I think that's the last one. Is there one more? And that actually does it. Yeah, that's, that's all the slides. On the nose. Right at 2.30. Amazing. So uh, David and Tim, uh, we just wanted to thank you so much for graciously lending your time and your expertise. And I'm sure our attendees uh, learned a lot from you or at least maybe uh, figured out a different way to approach a problem or maybe ask a new question. I think that's always the objective, right? Um, so we did include a contact information slide here if you have any uh, questions for the HOA Information and Resource Center or for Muller Graf, uh, feel free to reach out. Um, uh, other than that, David, Tim, again, we really appreciate you joining us and um, thank you very much for attending uh, our HOA forum today. Appreciate thank it. you. Nice Thanks for everyone. Oh, sorry, Tim, go ahead. No, thank you, Nick, David, and Amanda. We appreciate you uh, hosting this. Yeah, and everybody showing up and taking the time out of their beautiful Friday to be here. We really appreciate that sacrifice. Whether you're a board member, vendor, or uh, a homeowner, all of us speaking the same language is super helpful in minimizing disputes. So thanks for taking the time. No problem. Everybody have a great weekend. And uh, thanks. Thanks again. You too. You too. Catch you later. Bye-bye.